spine concept, cervical spine. We will start with cervical myelopathy. You will have gait disturbance. Gait disturbance means myelopathy. Once you have gait disturbance, this is an indication for surgery. You also will have upper motor neuron signs, upper extremity weakness, the hands are clumsy, you got myelopathy of the hand. The x-ray will show spondylosis and loss of lordosis. MRI will show compression of the cervical spinal cord. Some of these patients will have a lumbar spinal stenosis and they come to you with an MRI, but they have gait disturbance. Check the C-spine. Get an MRI of the C-spine. The exam may be confusing because they will come with low back pain and positive MRI for lumbar stenosis. Ask them about neck pain and stiffness and if they feel unstable when they walk. Then examine them for upper motor neuron signs, for spasticity, for hyperreflexia, for Huffman sign. The presence of this reflex indicates an upper motor neuron lesion due to cervical spinal cord compression. For clonus and for Babinetsky test. Gait disturbance can occur in thoracic disc, which occurs in males. You will have pain with radicular symptoms with normal upper extremity exam and you will have upper motor neuron findings in the lower extremity such as clonus and Babinetsky. If you're going to do surgery on cervical myelopathy, which approach would you use? You will do anterior approach of the cervical spine when there is a kyphotic spinal segment. You will go anterior, especially if there is cervical kyphosis more than 10 degrees, because you can correct that anteriorly. The airway compromise occurs when the surgery takes more than 5 hours in the upper C-spine and more than 3 levels and more than 300 milliliter of blood loss. You can go posteriorly, laminectomy and posterior fusion, but kyphosis more than 10 degrees is contraindication to going posteriorly. You will do this operation for multi-level compression. Complication from posterior approach, you can get infection. If you do laminectomy alone, you will have progressive kyphosis. C5 nerve root palsy can occur from anterior or posterior approach. Nobody knows why it happens. The nerve recovers, but it takes long time to recover. How about laminoplasty? It's not used when there is fixed cervical kyphosis. How about the somatosensory evoked potential? It is one of the spinal cord monitoring technique. It is positive if 50% decrease in amplitude or 10% increase in latency. How about the recurrent laryngeal nerve? Vocal cord paralysis on one side will give you hoarseness. The superior laryngeal nerve will affect the high note phonation. It can affect singers. Will be no vocal cord paralysis and usually occur when you deal with upper C-spine approaches. Where the rotation of the C-spine mostly occur? C1 and C2. About 50% occurs in C1 and C2.
How about flexion extension of the C-spine where mostly occurs C4, C5? Another important topic is ankylosing spondylitis. HLA B27 positive, chest expansion is less than one inch. You got a bamboo spine. You may have an occult fractures, especially the C-spine fractures. You got to suspect it, especially with somebody that have pain and negative x-rays. You need to get an MRI or CT to see it. You need to admit this patient and have spine precautions because they can get neurological deficit most of the time from epidural hematoma. X-rays will show marginal syndesmophytes and you must know the difference between ankylosing spondylitis and DASH. Involvement of the sacroiliac joint and the disc space favors ankylosing spondylitis. When do you do the surgery and what kind of surgery? You do a spinal decompression and fusion. Usually long fusion, especially if the spine is unstable or if you have progressive neurological deficit or if you have epidural hemorrhage. Charco of the shoulder. They will give you an x-ray of the proximal humerus that clearly disappeared and they will ask you what you're going to do next. You're going to get MRI of the C-spine because you may have syngomyelia of the cervical spine. Now let's go to cervical radiculopathy. We know that the cervical spine and shoulder problems overlap. You know that the condition is of cervical etiology if relief of the pain occurs with shoulder abduction by placing the hand over the head. In cervical disc problems, be aware of false positive MRIs. It usually involves the lower numbered root. So if you have C6, C7, you will get C7 nerve root. You will get the middle finger numbness. You will get the triceps weakness and triceps reflex will be affected. There's an easy way to remember the dermatomes and the muscle function. But let's understand the arrangement of these nerve roots. You got seven vertebrae, but eight nerve roots. So what happened? The cervical nerve root is horizontal in orientation. So it doesn't matter if the disc is central or the disc is foraminal, it will get the same nerve root. For example, if this is at the level of C6, C7, it's gonna get C7 nerve root. And this nerve root runs above the pedicle. So C7 nerve root runs above C7 pedicle. So you come to C8 nerve root, and this one runs above T1 pedicle, and then T1 nerve root runs below T1 pedicle. So let's start with C7. C7, you'll have the rest flexion. It looks like C7. And you can see that the wrist is flexed and the finger is extended. It is the shape of seven that will help you to remember that. If the wrist flexion is C7, then the wrist extension is C6. The finger flexion is C8. abduction is T1. The interosseae is T1. You can add shoulder abduction C5. And elbow flexion will be C6.
elbow extension will be C7. And triceps reflex is C7. You can see the dermatomes here, C6 is present at the letter 6, C7 at the middle finger, and the fifth finger will be C8. So the patient will come to you with unilateral arm pain relieved by arm elevation, and the numbness and the paresthesia will be in a specific dermatomes. When you examine the patient, you will do the provocative tests such as the spurling and the shoulder abduction test. Even if they show you a bad cervical spine disc on an MRI, you will treat it conservatively for about three months. You give the patient therapy and non steroidal anti-inflammatory medication. 75% of the patient will improve with non-operative treatment. When do you do the surgery? When you have persistent pain for 6 to 12 weeks and progressive neurological deficit. Thank you very much. I hope that was helpful.